So by now, everybody knows that there is a huge run up for the Bitcoin ETF and a lot of different companies are involved. Uh, Fidelity, BlackRock and also ARK. And Kathy Wood, who is the head of ARK Investment, came out on Bloomberg and answered a couple of different questions. And what she talked about was pretty eye opening. She talks about how Bitcoin, what the catalyst was. She also talked about how their ETF stacks up against BlackRock. And she talked about, more importantly, uh, just of the structure of the SEC and how it's actually weakening. And the article or the uh, interview piece was uh, pretty long, about 20 minutes. I'm just going to break it down in the top three or four pieces. And the first thing we're going to talk about, Kathy answers, is how things are going as far as what is the catalyst for Bitcoin since June? Where does she see things going? And then the uh, interview asked her another great question, which is, is Bitcoin a really good store of value, especially in this volatile market? So just take a listen. Yes, I do think uh, that the, in June, when BlackRock uh, announced its filing, or when it was announced that uh, BlackRock had filed for Bitcoin ETF, uh, the Bitcoin price did shoot up, uh, and but has been fairly stable since then. Uh, so I, I do think it's had an impact. A, a bigger impact this year was the regional bank crisis. It was very interesting to watch Bitcoin uh, go from 19,000 to 30,000 right in the middle of that banking crisis as uh, regional banks were going bankrupt. So it was a flight to safety. So uh, I thought that move was just as interesting. Hang on, a flight to safety? Is buying Bitcoin somehow a flight to safety? Isn't it a little too volatile for that? Well, if you think about it, uh, uh, Bitcoin serves as uh, two kinds of hedges. One is a hedge against inflation and outright confiscation of wealth. The other is against counterparty risk. And, uh, you know, when, when the regional banks started uh, going down, this fear sort of, uh, uh, you know, memory, uh, our memories are fresh with 0809, the counterparty risk uh, became real. And so there was this flight into Bitcoin, a completely decentralized, transparent uh, network, which is not subject to counterparty risk. Yeah. So I have to agree with her. It makes total sense, right? BlackRock ETF comes in, price goes up, people are excited. And of course, we have a bank collapse and there's a, there's a flight to safety. But the reason that I, I left this in is because as we move forward, especially in our four-year cycle, I still believe that the four-year cycles are intact. They've been doing pretty good for the last 13 or so years. And of course, next year, we'll see a halving in 2024. Then 2025, there should be, or I'm hoping there's a, a reasonable bull run. It could happen uh, in 2024 or 2025, quite honestly, depending on who you're listening to. So when she talks about this, this flight to safety and it's a good store of value, I bring this up because you're going to get this question from people that you talk to about Bitcoin and crypto and digital assets. They're going to say, this doesn't make any sense. How can this be a, a store of value when it's so darn volatile? And then if you just want to make it very super simple, just show them this, this little graphic here. Uh, 20 bucks, 1980 could get you a ton of groceries. 2000 couldn't get you much. In 20, and right now in 2023, how much can $20 get you at the grocery store? It just depends. Now, take a look at 2011 when, you know, Bitcoins were 20 bucks back in the day. And then 10 years later, you could buy in 2021 a very nice car. And in 2030, who knows? So as far as like a store of value, yes, it's volatile. But as time moves on, we can see how it actually preserves wealth. So moving on that, the next question uh, they're going to talk about is uh, the ETF timeline and who uh, will get approved first, and does it really matter? And just as a, as a point of reference, uh, there these are all the different companies that have actually uh, gone into uh, to be filing for uh, this ETF. So ARK, iShares, Bitwise, of course, uh, iShares is BlackRock, Bitwise, Vanek, Wizentree, Fresco, Fidelity, and Valkyrie. And you see that this, these are the dates that were filed in June or, or wow, Bitwise was October 2021. Let's see how that works out. But all of them are, are right in, in, this, in this general range. So the first deadline for ARC has come and gone. And I always think it's interesting that the first, it's like a deadline, but it's not a deadline. They're just going to ask for, for consumer feedback. And of course, they just push it to the second, then the third, and then the fourth. So ARC is the first one here. And if they don't get approved by January 10th, 2024, then that's it. It's done. 
if, and then all the rest of them, it's all about March 15th to the 19th. And that also includes BlackRock, which is March 15th, 2024. So we know that there is a time frame of when this can be approved or not approved. So just look out for these dates and uh, I will link this in the description below so you can find it very easily. So now let's get to the point where she's asked specifically about these ETF timelines and how things stack up. That uh, August 13th will come and go. And uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think the SEC, if it's going to approve a Bitcoin ETF, will approve more than one uh, at, at once. So great. So again, what she is saying is we totally expect uh, this to go through the process and we expect it with us to just to blow through that that got that deadline of August 13th uh, today it is August uh, 8th 2023 and they don't expect that second deadline to do anything they think it's going to go to the third and the final deadline and that could be for everybody but what was interesting is that she states that once one gets approved they all get approved and I have to agree but it just is getting over that hump as far as which one is actually the first one to get approved. And then next to last, she's gonna talk about, I think this is the most interesting piece, which is the SEC is actually getting weaker and the reasons behind that. So just take a listen. The two other branches of government, the judicial branch and the legislative branch, uh, are, are giving uh, the SEC pause uh, because the SEC is losing cases in court having to do with its regulations uh, around crypto. That's the first thing. And there are bills that are making their way through the House uh, and are seeing some bipartisan support. Uh, so I do believe that uh, Gary Gensler, I guess last week or 10 days ago, said something like, well, you know, I'm not the only one who makes this decision. There are five commissioners. Now, of course, we know they're weighted uh, towards uh, the Democrats, three Democrats, two Republicans. And so one assumes that uh, uh, the way that Gary votes is the way the, the FCC will vote. But he seemed to be distancing himself a little bit. And so maybe we can take that as a bit of a clue. Uh, we definitely did. We thought that was a, a good sign, but you know, we're reading all kinds of tea leaves in this. So, right. I couldn't agree more. I think, uh, the SEC has definitely been weakened, especially, uh, with the case against Ripple and them losing that, that decision by Judge Torres. But, uh, one of the things she we talked about was the, uh, the SEC and who actually uh, is appointing them. And of course their different political affiliations. Now she did say five and she did, she said it exactly correct. Uh, there are uh, three Democrats, that's Gary Gensler, Carolyn Crenshaw, and Jaime Lizarraga, or maybe Jamie Lizarraga, I don't know uh, uh, the uh, exact pr pronunciation of the name. And then, there, of course, there are two Republicans, Mark Ueda and, of course, uh, crypto mom Hester Pierce, who's been very vocal that she is very pro-crypto uh, digital assets and especially Bitcoin. So we can see that we have three against two, essentially. Now, there are some uh, different uh, bills that are being reached across the aisle, and looks like Democrats and Republicans are actually uh, moving forward in the same direction on some limited cases. That is very true. However, this is one of the reasons why I'm not, I'm very skeptical that this ETF will actually be approved, uh, especially with what um, Kathy's going to say in a little bit about the futures ETFs, uh, which is to me, if you have a futures ETF and you approve that, but you can't do a spot ETF, I believe that there is, there's more risk as far as manipulation uh, for the futures ETF. And because we know that, there's no reason why Gary Gensler shouldn't have approved a spot ETF by now. And then also, if you understand that uh, we have a democratic election or excuse me, a presidential election coming up next year, uh, you know that they want to, uh, of course, remain in power. And if you have seen the last two different uh, reports that have come out from the White House itself, this one being the uh, Comprehensive Framework for Responsible Development of Digital Assets, and this next one, which is Climate Energy Implications of Crypto Assets, you will know that uh, they are not very positive about, I mean, Bitcoin and digital assets in general, even though Gary will say, uh, quite emphatically that uh, Bitcoin is not a security. There's also this other thing about uh, the energy consumption. And of course, he is always talking with Elizabeth Warren and she is a big uh, negative crypto and building crypto army and so on and so forth. So again, I don't think this is a slam dunk that people think it may be. And that's why I've been talking about. But uh, to finish this up, and this was probably uh, the second uh, best point that she makes, which is about uh, the ETF itself uh, is Coinbase 
is the Coinbase surveillance enough and market manipulation to move forward? So just take a listen. What I find so interesting still, and this is uh, why we believe that uh, the SEC will lose the grayscale case, how can you approve a Bitcoin futures ETF and, and not a Bitcoin ETF? Uh, and, and in fact, if you're really thinking about consumer protection, uh, a, a futures ETF is swap space. So there's counterparty risk there that you would not have with a Bitcoin ETF, which is backed one to one uh, with uh, Bitcoin in Coinbase's cold storage. Uh, it still confounds me. Not to mention the, the point that Eric makes, which is that if there had been an ETF, a lot of people wouldn't have bought Bitcoin at FTX. <laughs> that was a pretty good takedown on that last piece. You know, you have to agree. If, uh, if Gary and the gang, if they would have gotten together and actually approved this spot Bitcoin ETF, then a lot of people wouldn't have uh, actually lost a lot of their funds and Bitcoin. Uh, with FTX and a host of other issues. So I know that Gary is big about consumer protections and protecting everybody and protect us harder. But in all honesty, what has Gary done so far while he's in office? And I got to tell you, it hasn't been that much. So anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then uh, last piece is just to note that uh, over at CoinGecko, I found this, this pretty interesting. CoinGecko is pretty cool. I, I do like using it. I use it all the time. Uh, it's free and it just you know shows us like uh, the different price action that's going on with crypto itself. But if you do you know that when you go to coingecko.com and if you click on very up here, it says categories, you click on categories and you can come over here. I like how it's got uh, all the different things where you can see like layer ones, layer twos, exchange based tokens. And this one they just added. I thought I found this quite funny. I, but, I mean, a little depressing as well, but it says alleged SEC security. So if you ever want to just figure out what the heck Gary was talking about as far as all the different uh, cryptos that they've named as securities. Now, they haven't directly named these things. They are just lawsuits against these different exchanges, but they've, they've stated these are what they consider securities. You can see that they've done uh, some pretty big damage to a lot of different cryptos. And we're still actually holding up pretty darn strong moving forward. And look at all these things. Man, they, had, they wasted no time to get going. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, these are the ones that bite the bullet. So congratulations, uh, Gary. You guys are really protecting us harder. So thanks so much. And then uh, also a little two public service announcements. This one was from CZ Binance. This is something that I do and I need to stop doing. And I need you to know about this. And this was a, a tweet he put, sent out yesterday. He says, the scammers are so good now that they generate addresses with the same char starting and ending letters, which is what most people check for when doing a crypto transfer. Uh, I gotta tell you, that's exactly what I do. I just look at you know, the, the first three, I'm like 0x15 and then F452, I'm like, great, that's it. But that is the wrong thing to do and uh, you need to be aware of this. So here's what happened. Scammer will use uh, this address to send you dust transactions. So the address is shown in your wallet. So what they'll do is they'll make the exact same looking address with the with the with the first four and the last four, but in the middle they'll they'll just rearrange some things so it looks like the same thing. So if you want to send to the legitimate address, you might just pick one previous transaction in your wallet, copy the address. This is what happened yesterday to a very experienced crypto operator. So they just looked at in their wallets and said, "Oh, I've already sent to this one. I re I remember this one zero x five three, and the last four is f two five seven." Great, they send it off and it goes to a scammer, unfortunately. And this last part is kind of concerning, quite honestly. He states a uh, positive ending for this one. The operator noticed the error right after the transaction and we were able to request the USDT to be frozen or tether, to be frozen uh, in time. So uh, I think we've all known about this in the past that uh, there is this ability for different stable coins to be halted, to be frozen. So if you think that everything's great in cryptoverse, that's not so. And lastly, uh, our last PSA for the day, uh, there's Simon, look at Simon. And uh, Simon Dixon uh, from Bank of the Future, I had him on the show for many a time. He's trying to do his best for everybody as far as with uh, the Celsius people who got screwed over like myself and you. And he's saying there's a, a pledge. Pledge of support is a Celsius creditor. There's a video he talks about. And what this is all, it's all about is about the committee 
and there's a lack of, and he talks about here, the lack of clarity by the tax consequences of the plan. There's different plans for, uh, for ad hoc earn and for different people who are in, who were in Celsius. Lack of transparency, the government provision, the plan, liquidation process, and he's talking about how this might be not the best thing. Litigation recovery process, and a whole host of different things. Lack of detail for the two billion claim against FTX. So he's saying that the, the lawyers who are putting this forward are not doing a great job. So he wants you to come over here, review the video, see if you want to do this and just fill out this form. Just pledge it, say, hey, we want more clarity before we make a decision as Celsius owners. So that is uh, uh, the PSAs for the day. And you can find the link in the description. But that's it for, for this episode. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. But that's it for this one. Thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.